Okay, welcome to the Athletic Development Show. Uh, special guest today, Riley Goodman. Welcome to the show, Riley. Thanks for having me. Uh, super excited to get you on. Lots of stuff to talk about. The first thing I think I want to talk about, though, and so you are uh, gold medal level at getting, getting and doing brilliant internships, um, and I want to talk about a, a few of those, um, and then about your work here at Core Advantage as a coach, and there's all sorts of other things I, I want to touch on um, your work as a, as a, is a scaffer? Is that the... Uh, yeah, is that what scaffolder, you, scaff. Scaffoldist. Yeah. Um, but I'm interested in diving straight into the uh, arguably one of the hardest, not arguably, definitely one of the hardest internships to get into in the world, the mm. Cressy internship which you did. Tell us about uh, how you went about that and, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, so it was end of 2019. Mm. I was finishing up my internship with Core Advantage after a year on 11 months of being here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd also just finished my degree in exercise and sports science and it was, it's towards the back end of the year and I was looking, well, I'm not really sure what's happening next year. Mm. Um, didn't know I was going to get a job here just mm. yet. That wasn't confirmed. Um, so I was looking towards what's the next step for me. Um, and I stumbled across Jamie Smith at strength culture and he'd done the Cressy sports performance mm. internship a few years prior. And I thought, ah. Oh, they, they take Australians. Why not, why not head over to America, pack on my bags for a few months and try it out um, and just apply it off my own back mm. and just uh, express interest just for the sake of moving from one private facility in Australia and seeing what they do in America mm. and how it's different, how it's similar in a lot of ways um, and just trying to take myself out of my comfort zone. So I moved over there. And tell me, what, what was the process like? Getting it. So um, one interview, two interviews, how did that all uh, unfold? Funnily enough, there was a similar thing where the initial form you fill out is very direct with how you should do it, Mm -hmm. something that we've also do similar where it has Mm -hmm. to be attention to detail. If you can't Mm -hmm. apply attention to detail, then you're going to miss. That's your first entry level criteria. It's a good filter, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah, it's it's a great filter for people. Um, And then from there I had an interview. So after getting accepted to the interview Mm -hmm. stage, had an interview at 4 a.m. in the morning, wow. which is just a nice 3 p.m. for them in the afternoon. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't, <laughs> they didn't, they didn't wor- try and make it easy for you? No, they hadn't looked too much into that. Um, that was the best time for them. So, yeah, uh, yeah 4, 4.30 in the morning I was up. Did you tell them? Did they ask you what time it was and did you tell them? They let me pick the time. So yeah. they said, oh, we've got these availabilities here. Um, and I had a time zone thing in front of me. I'm like, I can do 4.35 in the morning, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so made that work. Got up really early, showered, sat there for about half an hour. Um, had a great chat with John O'Neill, the high performance manager there, mm-hmm. and then Pete Dupuy. Um, mm-hmm. This is at the Massachusetts facility. So, mm-hmm. And then from there was lucky enough to get the call up. Um, had to figure everything out with visas. That was, that was up to me to organise, mm-hmm. but um, managed to do that at the start of 2020 before things turned a bit south. Mm-hmm. It was good timing. Yeah, uh, And in terms of the preparation for because they need you to be kind of hitting the ground running mm. and so they provide you with a fair bit of preparatory content. Yep. Um, what, what did that look like and how, how, how did you find it? Did you feel you were ready when you were good to go? It was tough. They, one of their main markers was to look at their exercise database. Mm-hmm. They have a massive, massive spreadsheet, spreadsheet from about 12 plus years of operating full of exercises that filmed and talked over. Mm. Um, one of our main things was to be across as many of them as possible and all the iterations that came with that. So just being prepared that when you're looking at their programs, you're, it's not just a bunch of gibberish. You can speak the language kind of. You can yeah. speak the language so that you're not there trying to apply your own previous stuff. Mm. You know what they use, you know what it looks like, you roughly know how to coach it. Mm. Um, yeah, that was, that was the main thing I recalled being nervous about going yep. over there. Yeah. And did you have them memorized? Like because you've got a pretty good memory. Yeah. Um, how, how would you rate how successful you were? I would say I learnt the language. So I understood <laughs> their position, implement, action. Yep. So everything would follow those three uh, criteria. Position, implement, action. It's a nice way of breaking it down. Yeah, yeah, so everything would follow that, like a split stance, cable, row. Yeah, that's actually good logic, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, so once you learn that language, it's just a matter of kind of figuring out all the positions, knowing all the implements and then knowing all the actions and you can Mm. can essentially speak that language, right? Mm. And then from there, it's just when you have a a fancy name attached to something like we like to do, like a Mm. Bulgarian split squat, 
you didn't know what a Bulgarian... Which we don't call it here at Core Advantage. We don't. Yeah, just a rear foot elevated split squat courtesy of Mike Boyle. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's only when you get stumped by the things named after people. Mm. I, hate, I hate the name of things after people or countries. I, I, I'm so much in favour of where the name... If you can read, if you can speak and read English, yeah, uh, you can think your way through what the movement actually could be. I think that's so much better. Yeah, tough, hard to do. Tough from a learning perspective, just to pick that up. Yeah, mm-hmm. the only one that's still, I think, probably the only one in the business that we have that's actually um, geographically named is the RDL. What about Copenhagen? Yeah, okay. There's two. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why I hang on. I, I, for some reason, I like Copenhagen as a okay. name. It, it's totally inconsistent of me, but I just like it for some reason. I would say an RDL would fit more, mm. makes more sense than a, a Copenhagen. I, I, I totally agree. I, I don't think a Copenhagen really justifies. It should be called a, um, a short lever or a long lever adductor bridge. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually the right name for it. Mm. Mm. Anyway, hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... You're over there yep. and you're kind of thrown in the deep end. Yes. Um, what was it like the first few days? What, what did they tell you? What did you do? And, you know, because it's for context for those that don't know about Cressy. So he is the – Cressy Performance is the number one baseball-specific strength and conditioning business in the world. They are one of the bigger S&C businesses in the world as well. They got in, got in early hmm. and Cressy did a really good thing of doing a tremendous amount of writing – really early on and just getting a big uh, name through getting his thoughts out when the, when the, the thought leader marketplace wasn't quite so crowded. Yeah. So did an exceptional job of grabbing that opportunity. Um, what was it like though in that first bit? You're quite intimidated. You, you're diving into this, you know, big step up in terms of facility. Yeah, what was that about? Well, I was, I was nervous. Obviously the, mm. the, the first day I was over there, moved into – a, a, like a little apartment underneath the house by myself. The other two housemates from different states in America weren't there yet. Right. Um, I had to catch an Uber to just to get there in a day early and just kind of wandered around as this quiet mm. little Australian boy yeah. <laughs> um, just trying to talk to people as much as I could. Mm. That was an informal start. And then come the formal start, it was um, similar to what we do here. It's gym safety first. Don't hurt anyone, mm. making mm. sure you can move in within the space and make sure the space is set up safety-wise, number mm. one priority. Mm. Um, and from there, it's just observe and just learn through osmosis, try to take in as much as you can. Um, one of the goals for week one or day one was you have to learn the name of every person that comes through the door. Yep. Um, so Same today, as us. Yeah. today, we were there right in their busy period, right mm-hmm. before uh, their spring training or preseason training for baseball, and it's like you're expecting one of our busiest days of the year is early January. Mm. About 100 plus people coming in today, you are expected to know 100 names. Wow. On That's the way lot. out. Yeah. Um, I don't think that was literal, but the, 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 the pressure was the put pressure on, there. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was the goal for the first little while. Just talk to as many people as you can and, and try get comfortable. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that much about baseball. Baseball is obviously not a big sport. Mm. in australia so although we do punch a bit above our weight we produce quite a few college level baseballs but it's just not on our on our radar is it it's certainly not a major sport mm. it may be in the top 10 you'd have to you'd have to argue we've that. i reckon in the last well i know in the last 21 years we've trained like maybe three baseballers like mm. and they've done well yep. but just it's not it's not a huge thing yeah and baseball strength and conditioning from what i understand is something that still needs work mm. um that is the fortunate side of where Cressy found their model. They didn't start out as a baseball specific gym. They happened to move into a building that had um, pitching cages next to the gym. And f- I didn't know that really. So from there serendipity. Yeah. From there it was just, Oh, there's baseballs next door. Let's get a bunch of baseballs in. And they found a, right. a niche through an underserviced market. I thought it was this brilliant move on the other. This was this brilliant strategic move, but it was just, they saw an opportunity and they were, they, they, Agile. they ran with it. They yeah. um, were flexible in their business model. They, they began more general and powerlifting base, I believe. Yep. Um, and then as, as business started to work for them, they, they made it work. Yeah. And so you made me think about it from the powerlifting point of view. So Cressy's own lifting I've seen over the years is pretty powerlifty. Yes. Uh, do they train their baseballers like that as well? There's, from what I saw, there's, there's, always those underlying things that come from 
from your roots. Mm. Um, there's certainly like in their gym space, there was a deadlifting platform in the middle. Mm. Um, it was, it was set up as you may see a powerlifting gym and some of their, some of their movements inclu- are inclusive of powerlifting, but they'll do things from the blocks, not necessarily from the floors. Yeah. Take the edge out um, of it. Yeah. They're still, they're still primarily focused on strength conditioning, but you can see the, um, you can see where powerlifting has had its influence mm. with time. Yeah. I can't believe I've never asked you this before, and this is a bit technical, so apologies for those that don't like going to the weeds, but if you don't like going to the weeds, this is the wrong podcast for you. So um, what about on bench press? So powerlifting bench is pin the scaps, yep. and pitching a baseball is all about not pinning the scaps. Yep. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do both. What mm. did, they, did they go a traditional powerlifter setup on, on a barbell bench? From what I saw, no. That right. could have been the part of the season that okay. I was there. There was yeah. certainly some people bench pressing, but that was more some of their general population clients. Okay. Um, the baseballers, again, in the se- part of the season there were, was a lot more dumbbell press, yep. uh, a lot more one-arm presses, working on anti-rotation-based mm. work with yep. that, um, some floor pressing. Um, they're a lot more focused about scapio thoracic rhythm and yep. making sure the scap can move freely around the rib cage yep. and everything surrounding that. Um, it's far more important for their pitches than a mm. heavy bench press. Mm. The, the upper body strength certainly still gets hit. They still do cable yep. flies. They, they, they find their way there. Mm. But the, the pinning back of the scaps on a strict barbell bench press, um, I didn't see it at all. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you really want the scaps to dance around the rib cage so that the, the shoulder can stay in a good spot. So. Makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, and when you're trying to maximise the amount of leverage you can you can whip around with mm. in a baseball pitch, mm. um, you want all the degrees of of movement that you can control. So you, you went in there not knowing lots about baseball. Mm. Um, I'm going to put you on onto the spot. What do you know about it now? T- tell us all about. Oh, ma- I, make me less baseball ignorant. I wish I could say I know more about the game. Yeah, I'll still watch the game, and I'm still confused the same way that if they watch cricket. They're, they're confused. They're yeah. confused. Yeah. Um, but the mechanics of a baseball pitch, because they mm. have a pitching station in the corner mm. um, with their own pitching coaches, they I understand a lot more about how that works and, and the positions that they have to get into and then how we leverage that as, as strength and conditioning personnel to like facilitate those positions. So what's the, what, are the, what are the big rocks there? What are the things that, that it's – what are the things that pitching is doing to your shoulder that you've got to – um, compensate against in terms of keeping, you know, arm care and just keeping it all healthy and good? Um, the main thing they're looking to, so arm care is the phrase they use, mm. is a lot of rotator cuff work. Mm-hmm. And that's um, cuff strength, cuff stabilisation and cuff and the sequencing of it. And mm-hmm. can, it, can it respond to the rhythmic stabilisations? Mm. Um, they use that to make sure that the rotator cuff is keeping that glenohumeral joint safe. And then from there... Their next big rocks from the shoulder would be the elbow, mm-hmm. Tommy John surgery. Yeah, what is Tom? I, I am elbows. Unless you dislocate one, like poor Ez did the. Uh, we we're talking about the other week on the podcast. Yeah. Unless you dislocate them, not a lot goes wrong with them apart from them getting noisy. When yep. you're, like my elbows are really noisy as, as I'm older. Uh, what's what? It, what's Tommy John surgery? I've, I'm embarrassed to admit I've seen it mentioned a bunch of times. Yeah. And I've actually not dived into it. What is it? What's uh, it for? Like, what's the injury it's for? It's for the cruciate ligament in the medial side of the, of the elbow okay. with the, the ulna, the yep. UCL, essentially. Okay. Um, it would be likened to the ACL, well, ACL uh, of the of field, school, field sport world. Okay, cool. Um, in the way that UCL is almost un- uninevitable in some ways, um, but preventable in others. Okay. Um, and, and it's the it's, kind of thing that it just it happens and, and you have to is, take the time to get it. Is it, right. it from the repetitive over internal rotation as they Yeah, grow? so they, they end up in and all, not all pitches are mm. the same, but they end up in extreme positions of layback where the external yeah. rotation of the shoulder is all the way back, which can Yeah, they're really in, out there. Yeah, incorrectly loaded, puts a lot of strain on the nerve and the ligaments. Yeah, okay. Of the medial elbow. So it's not the follow through, it's the wind up that's the really problematic part. And then the follow through, it's that it's, it's that contrast. stretch stretch shortening. It's that yeah, yeah. you're you're trying to create a lot of momentum back to then throw it forward. Yeah. And if you're working through that range completely passively mm. rather than relying on active structures mm. to generate that force, um, that's where you're gonna see breakdown of the mm. elbow a lot of the times. Mm. 
Uh, and what does Tommy John? Sorry for those that already know what this is. But what does Tommy John? Uh, do they just stitch it. Is it a graft from somewhere else, or they stitch it up again? What do they actually do? I've learned this at one stage, so I can't remember. I'll have to okay. get back to we'll, you. We will find a link, and we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and I'll read that too. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Cool. Uh, so you're over there doing that, mm-hmm. and um, I'm also curious as to what was your big. You're in a big place, mm. a famous place. How much bigger is it than, than here, for instance? How many of ours would you fit inside there? Mm, I think about this, about one and a half, maybe one point, slightly less, one point, like 25% right. more okay. about. So we've got a nice big gym here. Yep. Um, theirs is slightly bigger. Because I feel like it looks like it's quadruple our size. but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. One and a half, I'd say, is roughly right. We could look it up and... Yeah, and look, look, it's, it's a mathematical equation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely feels like a big empty room, mm. and they they um, obviously have part of that for their pitching, mm. and then the rest is track space and, mm. and open gym space. Mm. So, I want to talk about your visit to uh, one of my most important mentors, who I've never met in person, Mike Boyle, in yep. a minute. Um, but before we jump onto that, what was your biggest couple of takeaways from from Crazy Performance? What did you get out of that? Where you like this is you had to distill it down to a couple of things that you learned out of it. There's a lot. Mm. Um, it, it came at a really good time for me to solidify my knowledge that it came out of being at Core Advantage. Mm. Um, Core Advantage was my first exposure to strength and conditioning. I'd obviously been at university, but um, being here really showed me what this was like and how, how it's separate to general mm. weight training. Mm. Um, on a personal level, it just really served to solidify what I knew, challenge things. There was a lot of open discussion at Cressy. Mm. Um, they intentionally set up their internship structure to be loosely followed, a, loosely following a um, plan, but the, there was always room for discussion, yep. always things, room to open things up. So um, uh, We've made a little, based on your feedback, we've made a little change to our internship here where we're going to have a fortnightly, because a lot of it's online mm. and it, it is quite structured, um, but we're re- reverting back to a little bit more face-to-face where we've got once a fortnight a 90-minute a session together um specifically because I, I reckon what you that's a really valuable thing to have mm. i think we, we missed a trick not having that for a little while and so, some of the some of the best moments there were not even when interns were talking you'd have the coaches going back and forth or the mm. physios going back and forth with each other and you'd just be sitting there like i can barely even keep up mm. right now but this is this is fantastic um, sounds great and it's just a wednesday morning yeah, yeah that's um cool. yeah the the biggest things i learned from them were the value of specific training, but also the value of general training. Mm. Um, they have a lot to do, obviously, with shoulders and rotation, and with that comes loading up the back hip and mm-hmm. single leg work and one arm work, um, which is all training that almost every athlete should be exposed to for mm. for, for a lot of sports. Mm. And it, it was how you can how you manage that balance between what the athlete needs for their sport and then what they can get from the general preparation yep. that just improves physical qualities mm. all around. Speaking of, what are your favourite rota- rotational stuff can be done very ba- well and very badly sometimes. What are your favourite uh, war ball rotational things? What, what's your go-to that you think more people should be doing? Because um, you're good at that stuff too. It's very impressive where you, you make that ball thunk into, <laughs> into the wall. Yeah, they're very, very biased for, for good reason, for medicine ball work um, in the way that power development without. So medicine ball or slam ball? They call medicine ball. Do they the ones that they throw? Yeah, I, right, could, okay. I could be off on the on the yeah, technical that's fine. names. Yeah, there. Um, just that true power work where you can not have you have a release moment. Yeah, and you get to express that fully. Hmm. Um, your shop would explain pass. that a little bit more. I think that's so interesting. Is that so much of the gym because it doesn't have that release moment? Hmm. Like talk talk to me about that. Well, power training in essence is we're trying to reflect the qualities of explosiveness and fast paced hmm. movement when we're in the gym, um, the limitations of some traditional power-based training is maintaining form that is safe and not overextending and staying on the ground in, mm. <laughs> in some circumstances. Um, but in actuality, when there isn't an implement mm. and when you are running and jumping and throwing your, uh, launching your body or propelling your body entirely. It's such a funny thing because... It's like you're practicing jumping. It's like you're saying, okay, we're going to practice jumping, mm. 
but you're not allowed to let your feet practice the gr- leave the ground while you practice your jumping. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's literally a pretty big limitation on, on your jumping practice. Yeah, you're working against load, which is, which is great for, mm. for many reasons, but then you have to practice decelerating to mm. finish in a, in a mm. safe position. Um, so Whereas with the ball. With yeah. a ball, you get to launch it or mm. you get a little bit of with Olympic lifting where you get to have that moment where the bar floats up and you catch yeah. it. So um, power training can look like either of those things for whatever mm. reason, but to, to have a moment where something is released and something the force is truly expressed, mm. um, really important. So you're training a footy player or a basketballer or a soccer player um, probably less soccer, probably more the, the first two. Uh, what's the one thing you're going to pick for them using a ball? It's hard to say. Um, I think the rotational element's the main thing that you can yep. get out of medicine balls. You, you can use up other implements to get sagittal plane mm. and vertical vertical stuff. Um, even, ro- even jumping and stuff is a lot easier to do side to side, up and down. Yep. The rotational, just a shot put pass, just up, just nice here, push through, yeah. get your hips facing the wall, get it, get a nice, try get a nice hip shoulder separation, yep. and really create that rotation, get um, that transfer, yeah, and really practice expressing power through that rotary way. Because because some people look at that and they go, oh well, I don't need that to pass the ball or handball or whatever. But it's like it's not about that. It's also about like. When you're cutting, you're actually yep. there's that real transverse plane motion yep. within any cut. Yeah. So it's not just about projecting an object; it's about you as the as the weapon, kind of changing direction, isn't it? Yeah. That that loading up of the the hip and the mm. the rotation the mm. rotation muscles around around mm. the hip all work in the transverse plane when you're changing direction mm. when you're doing a lot of movement. So you need to make sure the body can express that in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. So a shot put pass would be kind of your go-to. Yeah, yeah that's a safe go-to. And then a scoop toss, if you're, if you're trying to really isolate um, rotation about the hips and just yep. trying to take the arms out of it, um, that's the go-to. And then when you want to add that shoulder, hip, get a little bit more yep. power, um, you, can, you can include that then. Mm. I hate the scoop toss because I'm, I'm not that good at it. And just kind of like it's this really kind of insipid – Impact against the wall. It's like, ah, uh, doesn't feel like it's, it's power. Yeah. Um, Pat's really good at it. He's got, yeah, he's his good. Golf, his golf background. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's reflective of that where he mm. can just generate from his hips. So it took me a while to get better at them. Mm-hmm. I love the shot, shot put pass a lot. I'm biased <laughs> in that way. <laughs> um, so you went, you were there for quite some time. And, and the, the model at Cressy is um, less structured. It's less, it's not a class setting, is it? It's, it's individualized with coaches floating around, which is more like we have it these days mm-hmm. here at core. Yep. Um, but then you went to boils, yep. which is, uh, very class structured, quite a, quite a, a contrasting environment, brilliant, but different. Yeah. Um, tell us all about that. Cause I, I can't hear enough about his stuff. Cause I think he's, I, I yeah, I think he's so clever. Yeah, fascinating for me to go to both places, mm, mm. which are geographically very close. Mm. It's surprising to have t- it. Good to have such. How close are they? Like an hour, I think. Right, I'd yeah, have okay. to. I'd have to check, yeah, but it, roughly, like, yeah. it, you could go there. You, yeah. We drove out there a couple of times to have a look. Um, yeah, and two very successful private strength conditioning places that operate on very differing but both equally successful models mm, in a way. Mm. Um, like you said, Cressy is that very, at the time was a very loose, you kind of, you had your time, but you come in, there isn't necessarily a, a group of people joining you when you're starting. Mm. It's just whoever's there at the time. Mm. Um, Boils is very much segmented into your classification as an athlete, mm-hmm. whether you're a general pop client, whether you're a pro athlete, whether you're high school and potentially even middle school, they might, or they might've mm. had that in the same, um, their day was separated into those categories. And, and it's would, short blocks, isn't it? Like 20 minute starts or half hour starts? Every 15 minutes 15 it was minutes. at the time. Right. You'd yeah. have, they would start with their foam rolling stretching, um, go to some movement skill, wall ball stuff, um, a few sprints that we know Boyle loves. Yep. Um, and then from there mostly progress. Only, only relatively recently too, I think it's, it's like one of the things I love about him is that he's constantly evolving what yep. he does because most of us, once we get above about 45, it's like whatever we learn up to 45, that's what we're going to stick with till we die. Yeah. Um, he's constantly evolving what he does. And the sprints emphasis, the mm. idea that, that it's kind of futile 
doing what we call high speed stuff in the gym is still so stupidly slow yep. that it's borderline irrelevant to, to what you're doing in terms of actual genuine velocity when you're moving down a track or in a field. Um, that's been a relatively recent thing that, that he's got into, but he's got into it hard. Yeah. Um, and I really like that. I think that's, he, that's, um, that's great. I was fortunate enough to go to their winter seminar. Unreal. So it would have been February yeah. 2020. Yep. Dan John was also a speaker there. Yeah, cool. Um, that whole day was fantastic at their yeah. facility. And he spoke for about two hours on everything he'd learned recently yeah, and all the changes he'd made to his mm. programming at his stage in his career when, he, when he'd seen it all and probably mm. done it all. Yeah. Uh, he was willing to get up there and talk about the things that he'd changed his mind on and, and developed further. One of those being um, sprint work and just the importance of a dose of sprint work yeah. once or twice a week, just even, even if it's maintenance, but otherwise for developing that quality, he would have his athletes, um, they do about a 15 metre sprint. Yeah. Um, once they warmed up and time it, they're racing against themselves. They're trying to beat themselves mm. every week. Um, and, force that competitive 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 push without necessarily racing someone where you can go a little bit overboard it's such a clear i love how the tightrope of that because if you if you make two people race against each other Mm. you will get a bit of a sympathetic dominant response nervous system wise and you'll tighten up a bit and your chances of tearing something are actually reasonably high yeah uh, but if you make someone just try and beat their own best time, yep. you're getting the intensity benefits. So you're getting that micro dosing of maximal intensity, yep. but below the threshold where you're likely to get soft tissues. And he did, you know, some ridiculous thing like 10,000 reps over the summer and zero problems. Yep. Um, but it was really having them, them really go after it, using, using timing gates every time. So it was every single run was time. So you, yep. you really pushed. I love that. Yeah. yeah and you can, you could, he would leverage that for, it's a readiness check. You can see. Mm-hmm compared to yourself, are you there or it's just very easy to overload, tell someone to go 100% mm. and it's, it's versing themselves. So mm. um, that was one of, the thing, one of the major takeaways from that day was yeah. the, the importance of a dose of sprint work. It's one of the reasons when we reorganised the gym here, we took everything off the yeah. track because we realised with, with the um, ongoing lockdowns and the, the stop-start nature of the, the time we're having sports-wise, Mm. When people are in here, it's like, okay, we need to make sure we can get that micro dose of yep. high speed work into them, yeah, uh, which has been really good, yeah. Uh, and so the facility there, it's pretty structured. You work your way through in a group, and you have to kind of go with the group. You can't just wander around. It's it's quite different. Yeah, um, it's almost like you're on a ride, isn't it? Like, yeah, <laughs> you sort of have to go through. Uh, what was that like from your observation of the coaching? How does that change from the the dynamic of Cressy to Boyle from what the the coaches have to bring into the equation because it's actually an almost it's as different to me as beach volleyball is to indoor volleyball those two coaching yeah we weren't watching the olympics lots of all these things <laughs> on my mind um what was that what did you see difference wise in terms of how the coaches had to approach that challenge um a few things uh, i think another step back from that is cressy they have individualized programs mm-hmm um, similar to what we do, you yeah. have you have the athletes that get programmed by specific mm. coaches, mm. Um, and they check in with them, and they're, they're essentially managed by them. They're coached yep. by everyone, yep. um, but that's their one person responsible for yep. what they're doing in the gym. Um, Boyle works on within their class system. They they have phases of training. Um, at that time, Boyle was writing all the programs, and then the adjustments would come from the coaches, mm. knowing the groups and knowing their athletes, um, and being reactionary to what the athletes presented mm. them with mm. um so you see a lot more corrections on the fly and adjustments on the fly from their coaches yep. making them think on the feet uh thinking on their feet um and just probably more focusing on pure coaching mm. i'd say that would be the benefit is just you have to get in there and you have to coach the best you can with mm-hmm. what's in front of you um as opposed to preparing something and just kind of letting it play mm. out on its own letting it kind of happen yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think you're better at? Because uh, be- you're an evolving coach. Yeah. You know, it's still a thing you're working on. Um, I think I'm better at having something pre-planned. I like to have something mm-hmm. ready to go, but that's, as with everything, it's based off your experience. That's what I've been exposed to. Mm. Um, here and there, it's, you've got to figure something out on the fly, and that's, that's testing, but it's also... Exciting in a way. The, pr- the mm. problem solving of it all is, is part of what keeps you in it, really. 
um, the creativity you can apply to that and the workarounds mm. is really interesting. But um, in terms of my coaching experience, I've got I've been able to see more, uh, not copy, mimic, and and mm. learn learn from more individualized mm. delivering program as opposed to, um, uh, yeah, working on the fly, working with just what's got what you've got in front of you yeah. in at the top of a hat. Yeah, I don't know what I like more. I think I, I'm, I'm interested in, in problem solving when you've got all the time in the world and you get to um, really think through what's the perfect thing mm. for this person. But also I, I do quite like when you've got someone on the floor and, you, and you've just got to kind of MacGyver it in the moment and, yeah. and fix what's going wrong with them and you get this sort of um, magical result of, wow, that suddenly look, it goes from looking crap to looking really good yeah. in 30 seconds. And I think it's something as you get experience like um, – as you're newer, you kind of you know what you're taught, mm. and then as I've had the good fortune of being very lucky to do all these internships, I've seen a lot of people operate in a lot of different ways. So you're kind of pinching tools mm. and ideas mm. from tool belts, and it's like, all right, I can use this now. So mm. as you get the requisite experience, you can then choose when to apply that, or you're like, I've seen this somewhere, I can I can safely use this on this yep. person now. Mm. Um, and I'll definitely say I'm getting a lot better. Mm. at that yeah you are yeah uh so big takeaway from from boil what's the um if, if anything what's the big thing that you took from that um that that idea of being able to always adjust mm. and it, on that day in that seminar dan john spoke about it it's you gotta you gotta listen to these things that come up on social media and everything and there's good takeaways and good lessons to be learned but you also got to find what are you taking out to put in so you have to weigh up. Are you are you taking That's so important? Are you taking out a big rock to put in something you've seen on the internet, mm. or have you done? Have you been like Boyle, where you've rethought everything? We were like another big thing was he he favors his single leg training. Yep. Um. In a lot of cases, he puts his single leg training before his mm. bilateral training, yep. and it's he's still doing both, but he's finding a way just to, without even removing anything, just just leverage one and put more value into one than the other he has single-handedly shifted the our entire industry on single leg training like when, when i started out coaching it was just i don't know it was like you do an ice to grass squat or you do jane fonda exercises yeah. and jane fonda exercises were you know aerobics yeah. lying on your side hip lift or a split squat like anything that didn't involve iron on your back yeah or lots of iron was just you know it was bullshit mm. um whereas he really pushed the idea which I can't believe that it, this was revolutionary in like 2003 that sports played one leg at a time. So maybe we should get strong one leg at a time. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause the loads are so like the adductor loads of single leg work are so different. Yeah. And the, the adductor loads of change of direction in sport to, to a bilateral movement. Exactly. So yeah, that was, that was one of the big takeaways I had from that. Sorry, I have my phone on Do Not Disturb, but my wife's called and apparently she's got special privileges that came through. <laughs> my right. um, I got a little distracted. Uh, so you went from the Cressy internship, the American experience, you came back here and did you already have the VIS internship lined up or did you get that after you got back? So the VIS internship so the Victorian was- Institute of Sport, for, that, for our, our overseas listeners, uh, Australia has an, an Institute of Sport system, which is a part of why on a per capita basis, we are one of the best sporting nations in the world because we actually our government invests a bit of yep. bit of money in that, which yep. which helps a lot. Uh, and they're very prestigious gigs. And so Riley um, is at the Victorian Institute of Sport, which is a, it's a kick ass gig. I think yep. It's a really great learning experience um, and very coveted. Uh, so how did you how did that happen? Yeah. So uh, continuing from Cressy, came back. Mm. We had our COVID lockdowns. Yep. Um, Managed that through all of 2020. Mm -hmm. Came back, came out of that that late 2020. I'm not sure the exact month. Mm -hmm. um, And began working here when when was available. And I was when we were open. (laughs) When 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 we were open. um, And I was just looking for more. I was Mm. I was ready to keep learning. Mm. Um, The internship model serves my style of learning a lot more Mm. from what I've from what I've figured out. Um, cause you're a Socratic learner. You like to ask questions. Yes. That's, that's your learning methodology, which is a great way to learn. Yeah. That was something early before I started the core advantage, uh, internship, it was, yeah. it was told to ask a million questions and I kind of took that 
yeah, and yeah. run with it. So I, I go out of my way to ask as much as I can. Stupid, not stupid. Like uh, it's, it's it's a mild superpower. I mean, it, it, if we, I think it's one of the main reasons that that we hired you because you ask thought provoking questions that flip things on their side that that make you deconstruct stuff rather than just assuming you, you know. It's like that five wise thing where you don't just ask the superficial question, but you ask mm. deeper into it. It's a, it's a great trait. Um, not enough people ask questions enough or yeah. good questions. That's, ask them for the sake of them. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess I was going somewhere where I can ask more questions. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a good way of putting it. Yeah, um, yeah that was at the end of, end of last year, and that's been happening since January mm. 2021. Yep. Getting to the back end now, so yeah, it's, it's getting be- a bit – the racking there, but um, yeah. that's been fantastic. And so you've been working under uh, a great strength conditioning coach, high performance coach, Ben King. Yep. Uh, he's a ripper. Yep. I'm looking forward to having him out here soon, um, both on the show and for uh, some PD with, with our team. I saw him at, at an ASCA presentation and was very impressed with his plyometric continuum. Mm-hmm. Uh, what sports you've been doing? You get to do some really interesting stuff there. What have you been – what are the sports and athletes you've been tasked with? Um, yeah, so, so the model is there that we have, there's s and staff, they have their own sports that they work within. Mm. And then those who have trainees have the trainees in a mentor-mentee relationship. And then you work with that coach to service the, uh, mm. the, the sports. Um, Ben's quite a unique case where he's got a wide range of sports. Mm. Um, he's got shooting. Yep. He had golf, but that has since departed from the VIS. Mm. Um, but from there, he's got some basketball athletes, um, table te- para table tennis, table tennis, badminton, yep. um, a whole host of things, which for me was very interesting going in. I was looking for the chance to see a lot of different sports mm. um, and see the, the requirements that come with those. Um, but it, it's got to be it's got to be ten plus different sports. Yeah, it's it's hard to keep up with sometimes. That's great, and quite a few at the Olympics. You've had you've got to yep. watch people yep. go over that, which which is always really exciting, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's been one of the highlights this year. Mm. One of the silver silver linings of COVID was a well timed VIS internship internship within uh, an, Olympic an Olympic year. Yeah, because um, there, there's something special about being at that it's, institute when it's happening because that's a yeah, buzz there. That's, yeah. what that's what they're there for. That's what yeah. the coaches have spent the, the years building up for. Mm, mm. Um, so very thankful that it's been timed that way. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. And uh, I'm hitting you hard for takeaways from everything, but that's, that's in my nature. Mm. What, what are the takeaways so far from, I suppose I'm interested in talking about the difference between a commercial strength and conditioning environment, like, mm. Oils, Cressies, yep. and Core Advantage, yep. uh, and an institute level because it is a different dynamic. Like, yep. yeah, what what do you notice that's different? Um, I'm curious about about all that. Yeah, so that's I, I like to think about it. Um, we talk about it depends a lot yep. in strength and conditioning and, and the context of things. The context of an athlete mm. is almost always the main thing, right? Mm. Um, second to that is the context that you're working within. Mm. Whether that's whether you're working in Australia or America, there mm. is cultural context there that, that has a place. What are the differences you noticed? Um, the main things is that I noticed at least is the major sports certainly have an influence over strength and conditioning. Mm-hmm. When you've got a big sport like NFL throughout the whole country, people start weight training early and they start tra- weight training heavy. When you say early? From what I understand, it's like, their middle school is like 13, 14. The expectation, yeah. expectation is that you're putting on muscle and size early mm. um, while still feeding those athletic qualities. Mm. Um, and I just think the, the major sports have influence of, over what's taught in the yeah. same way that Australia with um, football and netball and basketball. With Aussie rules football. Yeah. yeah um, has a lot more running and a lot more field open running to it. Mm. Um, I think that plays a lot into the, our – Baseline foundational um, S and C delivery. Well, we get called the fitness staff a lot. Yeah, I don't reckon they would get called the fitness staff in America, would they? They'd be called the they're, strength. They're far staff. more likely just to be called a strength coach. Yeah, um, yeah. Whereas we're in a lot of circles, uh, strength and conditioning. Yeah. We like to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was some of the major influences. Mm, mm. Um, Big difference, isn't it? But when you're comparing a private setting to an mm. institute, there's. Um, the context of that being is if you're in a private institute, there's always an element of sales to it. 
You mean a private, a commercial environment like a ours? Commercial, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, the the whether you like to admit or not, there's there's an element mm. of sales and mm. customer service and customer satisfaction within mm. um, mm. the business. You're obviously you want buy-in, you want trust, you want a good relationship um, that doesn't rely on that. But to some extent, that has to play a factor. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a business at the end of the day. Mm. Um, whereas at an institute system, you're a service provider. Mm. and your job is to provide physical preparation, sports performance training yep. to the best of your abilities in collaboration with coaches mm. and physios. Um, not to say that's not what we're trying to do no, here. No, yeah. uh, it's just you. there's expectations of the athlete and working with the athlete that are, that are slightly different. It's a different vibe, isn't it? Yeah, if your athletes at an institute system are expected to turn up, they're expected to do the workout put in front of it. If mm. they enjoy it or not, that's not really. Uh, a put- it's not as much of a KPI, is it's it? It's not as much of a KPI yeah. of, of the staff. It, it, of course, important to them, but um, they are they are results and performance driven. Mm. But the the customer satisfaction and customer service still has its element mm. within a business. Mm. I am um, where we're trying to push here. My my sort of my utopian ideal for here is where we have this commercial level skill at sales, but it's not about getting, it's not about selling people and joining up yeah. where actually the joining up process is a filter. We're trying to, we're, we're so busy that we're trying to not take people on. Yeah. Um, but the sales job is actually on doing the non gimmicky kick ass things that'll make you brilliant. Like I, I want us to be, really good at selling the stuff people really need yeah. Um, rather than just trying to get people through the door. It's actually, no, get people to do the right stuff. Yeah. Because there is a battle for hearts and minds at the moment with dumb stuff. Yeah. <laughs> dumb stuff is easier to sell than, than good stuff yeah. in, in our industry. It's weird. It's like if we were making cars, it's, I was talking to, I caught up with, uh, with Rob Blinkhorn, one of our founding people at Core Advantage today for lunch. Yep. And we're talking about how this weird thing where in our industry, um, it's like if you were making, if you had a Mercedes versus a Datsun, um, which is a really crappy car for those that don't know, because uh, Datsuns are old now, aren't they? I don't know. You cars. don't know what it is. <laughs> I've heard the name, but okay. uh, cars cra- is not cra- my specialty. It's a crappy old car. But anyway, um, it's really obvious that the Mercedes is the better car. Yeah. But often in, in our space, you can have really sexy looking training that is clearly inferior to those that know. Mm. But actually, the flaws of that training make it look really good. Yeah. Uh, so it's a weird, it's a weird spot we're in with that. Um, yeah, it's funny. Um, I want to talk about another thing before we we wrap up, mm. which is one of the reasons that got you through the door in the internship because you didn't interview great. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were what what I what I took from the interview. You were very reserved, mm-hmm. and my my fear was that you were clearly smart, but that you mightn't have the ability to drive that projection as a coach that you need to actually be able to kind of control a room. And at that point in time, the way Core Revenge was set up was it was much more Boyle-esque yep. class definitely, definitely. setting. And you needed to – there was a performance element to being a coach. We needed to put on a, a, a performance to that group to control them and move them through. And there was, there was yep. more of a – you had to really pump that energy into the equation. Yeah. Whereas now it's, it's not the same. It's a different – because it's the adult-oriented – athlete driven model. Yeah. Um and so yeah, my question mark on on you um was would you be a a good fit for delivering that kind of coaching? And, and happily we've changed that. So now it's the a model the model we've actually we've changed from a model that's more suitable for your um predisposition. Um but one of the reasons this is the longest question ever, this is terrible. One of the reasons that I hired you, that we took you on for the internship rather than not hired you, uh was your scaffolding background. Yeah. Because I have this real bias towards people that have worked hard jobs. Yeah. I will almost never hire a person who comes in and they say, oh, I've just worked, you know, in this easy job. Like, eh, if, if you've worked in an easy job, then you might think core advantage is hard work. Yeah. But if you've worked in a job with genuine labor where yep. you're having to lift things in hot weather, having a hard time, yep. then it's always going to be easy. So that, that was what um, – Probably got you over the line. Yeah, and in freezing cold weather. And freezing cold weather as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us all about the experience. I, uh, so what, what does a scaffer do? How does it all work? Um, 
scaffolding. Take me to scaffolding school. <laughs> uh, so scaffolding is obviously what's used in construction to go on the outside of the building. It's, it's essentially setting up platforms for people to work on, mm. uh, a lot of rendering, painting, um, any kind of fixture work externally. Mm. Um, I was fortunate enough to have family friends that own a business in that and pretty much a week or a few days after I finished my exams in year 12, I started working there. Okay. Um, just wanted money straight yeah. away. Was it good money? It's good money. Yeah. Good working early morning to mid afternoon. Mm-hmm. You kind of forget, like you have the rest of your day, you have your night That's time nice. to socialize. Yeah. Um, it, it, it didn't always feel like eight hours work, mm. but sometimes you clock up eight hours work, especially if you have to start a little bit later, it can, it controls your whole day sometimes. Mm. Um, it was very much, you get up and work and you were done. Mm. Mm. Um, I did that for four to five years. It's a long time. While I was at university. Um, I dipped back into it a little bit last year mm. during COVID because I was still able to work. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I served there as a labourer for a long time. Did it do what I think it does for people that make everything else seem easy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I hadn't done any coaching before I came into Core Advantage. Yep. Hence, my, to my surprise, when I was able to get a job here. <laughs> um, that is certainly if I had my time again. So you'd coach more and scaff less? Coach more, scaff less. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, I would have done junior sport. I would have done any sort mm. of coaching. Um, mm. At that time, I wasn't aware that I wanted to be a coach as much. Mm. I was at university doing exercise science, but I mm. didn't know which pathway I wanted to take it. So hindsight's a bit, hindsight's a bit 20, 20 on yeah, that yeah. one. But um, do coaching earlier. Is that would be your something, advice. Yeah. It's something when someone says they've got a younger brother or a younger sister that wants to get into this stuff, Mm. Or even athletes say to us, yeah. I'm thinking about exercise sports science. Mm. I'm mm. like, that's great. Go do some coaching. Yeah. Go yeah. start working with people. Go start delivering sessions, seeing different types of personalities, mm. um, work with kids because that is hard. Do you know, <laughs> such a good point. I, um, when I was in doing my first degree, I yeah. didn't have a lot of money and I got a paid gig as a basketball coach. And I, I've forgotten about it until recently because I've just started coaching. Um, my daughter's basketball team. And I was like, oh, actually, I did this like 15 years ago. Yeah. And I think that's a bigger, I think I've probably undercredited that. I've overcredited the Socratic method yeah. <laughs> and undercredited coaching a bunch of under 12 year olds. Mm. Cause I just, I had uh, like, I was coaching from, you know, 1991. I was actually delivering coaching, even though I wasn't strength interesting coaching, I was just learning how to do that. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's even better to learn how to coach before you know all the technical stuff yeah because you just have to get by on coach craft rather than technical craft yeah that, whereas i've had to and, and we've spoken about this but mm. i've had to work on that balance between knowing technical craft and knowing coaching craft mm. um to the detriment of the coaching craft if, if i'm honest mm. um i picked up the technical stuff really quickly yeah the coaching run your wheelhouse the, yeah. the coaching stuff has taken more conscious effort and yeah. it's obviously an ongoing learning experience yeah. But the, um, the coachy part of coaching is is most S and Z coaches' weakness. Yes, it's you know um, getting, getting good at that. Yeah. But fortunately, between working here and being at the VIS, the people like yourself and Ben who mentor me certainly push that upon me. <laughs> you hear you hearing it in stereo. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Uh, I get it's the good. I get the right advice to work on the coaching. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the to go to your original question, mm. um, it scaffolding laboring made this seem like a breeze. Yeah. Um, I, I must've mentioned to it early on. I was just, I was coming in here working, doing internship. I was here a few nights a week. I came in to train on other nights and I was like, it's not, it's not even work at all. Mm. Like this, mm. this doesn't feel like it's just fun. anything. Have you tried being, <laughs> have you tried being out in the freezing cold? Have you tried lifting tons of steel yeah. all day? Um, it was, it's been great to scaffolding had its perks, of course. Mm. But it's it seriously made this job feel like a breeze. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think d- do something hard, but also do something coachy. Yeah, um, pretty early. Yeah. All right. Um, this has been awesome. Uh, thanks for shining a light on all those experiences in the states and uh, and back here. Um, what can people follow you on? So it's coach. Oh, Instagram. Uh, on Instagram, yeah. Rileygood.coach. Get around it. Uh, uh, Riley does some good content on that. Yeah. I uh, need to get back into posting more, but you'll see me on the Core Advantage socials as yeah. well from time to time. Sounds great. And in terms of show notes, what have we got anything else that we've been through? Probably not, I think. Um, we've got to figure out what UCLs. 
Yes, that's our homework. Surgery okay, UCLs. cool. <laughs> we will find you a resource to talk about Tommy John. And that is my bad for not <laughs> forgetting that. <laughs> that is all good. All right. Thanks heaps for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you next week. And thanks for coming on the show, Riley. Thanks so much. See you guys all later. Right. Cheers. Okay, hope you enjoyed that episode. You'll find all the relevant show notes over at coreadvantage.com.au. Uh, also on the website, you can find more information about our uh, athletic development services, education, uh, short courses, and uh, everything else we're up to. So that's coreadvantage.com.au. Cheers, guys. See ya.